Welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here today. Hey, look, if there's one person that I would want to have a personal conversation with or sit in a lecture and hear from as it relates to planning for the new year, that person would be Robbie Green. Robbie Green knows what it is to plan for the future. He knows what it is to lead within a small ministry, medium-sized ministry, and a large ministry. And the principles in which he teaches his own staff, the principles he lives by, and the ideas that he'll share with you today, well, they're all congruent and the same. And today we're going to be hearing from him in just a moment. Before we do, welcome. We are glad each and every one of you are here. Uh, I know it's not a busy holiday time for you. I know you're not running from meeting to meeting and planning to planning and party to party. But the fact that you are making time to be with this uh, group today, we are glad to see you. A lot of you are watching this. Uh, later on, and you're taking notes and following along uh, a little bit later on the replay. We are welcoming you as well. Robbie's been one of the uh, great leaders of our network for so many years, a major supporter of what we've done in the past, and the host of the Coming Ideas Summit, uh, which is coming up right around the corner. Which, Robbie, we have some very exciting uh, just developments, lots of uh, speakers that are coming and and new opportunities. So we're excited about hearing uh -huh. more about that in the weeks to come. Before we do it any further, I'm gonna throw it over to my uh, partner in ministry, Jeremy Rands. Jeremy, if you'll take it from here. Oh, there we go. Hey guys, good to see you guys today. Hey, let's do this. We're gonna pray. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to have um, Andrew Peters, you're going to pray for us in just a moment, if you don't mind. Tony, give us an update of how your Thanksgiving went, how things are going at church, how things are going with your family, and uh, any update and prayer that we need for your son. But I want to hear all about it. I've, I've seen a couple of things that look like you had a great couple of weeks at your church. So tell us all about it. Uh, we we definitely did. Uh, it's I thank God we were praying that God would give us like just health uh, because a number of weeks ago my son got so sick from his chemo that he ended up spending seven days in the hospital, and so they adjusted things and he got to stay home for Thanksgiving and so we were able to have a really dynamic Sunday for Thanksgiving and everything went really well and so we praise God for that. So if I could ask you guys to be in prayer for one big thing uh, Monday. Um, he goes in for scans and uh, you guys know that we've been at this for almost a year and a half and it just means that they keep pulling options off the table um, and so you, you guys can imagine how that feels as a parent and things like that and so uh, we go in Monday to find out how his current treatment is doing and uh, to be honest the treatment that he's on right now is just making him sick all the time and so it's just discouraging seeing my son, my son uh, so sick and so it would be worth it to push them through this if, if it's working, uh, but we find out on Monday. And so um, if it's not, then it just, you know, just complicates things because they're, they're going to offer us a lot of options that don't have good outcomes or very low percentages of working. So I appreciate all you guys and your prayers. Andrew, Andrew Peters, why don't you pray for us? Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be with uh, this group of people. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come alongside one another and to be in prayer for one another. Lord, I pray that uh, even in our own ministries, we're fervent to pray for others. Lord, we thank you uh, for Tony and his family and, and what they mean to their church. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in prayer for, for Logan. So Lord, we're, we're going to lift him up right now, asking yeah. that uh, things go well Monday, Lord, you give them a report, a, a direction, Lord, give the doctors wisdom uh, to, uh, to know exactly what direction to head. And Lord, we're going we're gonna to give you the honor and praise for it. Lord, I pray that's not something we just say by cliche, but Lord, may you help us that even in these uh, difficult times, Lord, to truly honor you with our lives, to give you praise for everything you allow us to be a part of in your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate you guys being here today. I want to give you one quick announcement, and then I will turn things over to Robbie Green uh, in just a moment. The summit is coming up. It is, it's, it's upon us. It's going to be here before you know it. Several of you are already registered, but a lot of you are not. Make sure you get registered. You have a 30% off 
uh, coupon code to get in for 30% less than everybody else. The price will go up in December. Uh, so make sure you get that in. It's a better discount now than it's going to be when the price goes up. Of course, that discount code is good up until the summit actually starts there in January. But we want to have you there. We want to see you in Dallas, Texas, and get to rub shoulders with each of you guys. Robbie Green is a friend to all in the network. And Robbie, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule uh, with your staff to be with us today. Robbie's going to talk about planning for the new year, and I'm excited to see the direction he takes it today. Robbie, thanks for being with us. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. Well, it's great to be with everybody today and uh, look forward to hopefully being a help uh, in discussing a couple of things. As we're looking to the new year, uh, I don't know about you, but there's something about just that natural reset that we get in uh, January that just is motivating to me to, to want to roll up my sleeves and do more for the Lord and, and be effective. I think there's two areas that at least I found in my life, in my ministry, if I can deal with these two areas and plan effectively in these two areas, there's so many areas that that I don't have time to deal with, but if I deal with these two, it just sets the pace for everything. And so I want to talk to you in planning for the new year, specifically about our sermon prep, our sermon planning, and then also our leadership of, of the team. Now, I, I recognize that there are many senior pastors that watch this, but I recognize there's many staff guys that, that watch this. So I want to encourage you, if you're staff, don't, uh, the temptation to maybe mentally check out might be there. I'd encourage you to not do so. Um, I wish I had developed this planning when I, you know, I was children's pastor for many years. I wish I had developed some of these techniques many years before I stepped into the senior pastor role. And so I think this will be a help to you regardless of whether or not you're senior pastor or a, a assistant pastor or staff uh, member. Uh, but in full disclosure, I am talking predominantly to our, our senior pastor friends today. Uh, I think one of the things that has helped me tremendously in planning for the year is making sure that my week is properly planned so that I can get the sermon written on Monday. And I often bring this up to guys that I'm coaching and they're like, wait a minute, you, you get the sermon written on Monday? I'm like, yep, on a normal Monday when I go to bed on a normal Monday night, yesterday was not normal, I had a funeral, but on a normal week, when I go to bed on Monday night, I could preach the sermon for Sunday. And the immediate question that I get is, well, how do you get that done on Sunday, on Monday? Like, there's no way you can put together a whole sermon on Monday. And they're right. The way that we go about that is by advanced planning and looking ahead. And I want to talk to you for a moment about how I have found the sermon planning uh, process to be very effective for me. This is not original with me. I, I gleaned it from a number of guys, tweaked it to be what, what works for me. Uh, but let, let's take, uh, for me, I block out a six-month plan of sermons. I used to do a year at a time. I think Tice does a year at a time. But for me and our ministry here, there seemed to be enough changes beyond six months that I, I, I didn't want to be locked in completely. So for us, we do a six-month planning time. I plan for, for example, what I'm preaching in the spring was decided back in September. I will decide this March what I will preach in the fall. And obviously has plenty of time to prepare and to get ready. So what does that look like in, in, in a sermon planning retreat? Because that would be the first idea, is getting a sermon planning retreat together so that you can get to a place that you can write the sermon on Monday. Let me just briefly walk you through what that looks like for me here, and, and, and maybe it'll be a help to you. I found by getting away for a week, I leave on a Sunday evening, I come back on Saturday getting away for a week and uh, getting to a quiet place that's free from distraction. I, I have a place that I go almost every time up in North Carolina in the mountains and get a cabin and I'm secluded. It's just me and the Lord and, and I can think and pray and meditate. Of course, over the 
previous six months leading to this sermon retreat, I have already worked on uh, pulling a lot of ideas into Evernote. As God speaks to my heart randomly, I'm, I'm, I'm uploading ideas constantly. But when I get here at the sermon retreat, this is where I'm really going to, the rubber hits the road, and I'm going to get alone with the Lord and decide what is it that I'm going to preach for these 26 weeks, that I this block of series of messages that I'm dealing with. I'm really not so much worried about the title at this point. I'm really not even worried about the series title. I want to come up with the big idea for the series, and I want to come up with how many messages that's going to be and the big idea for each of those messages. Uh, I, I'm more of a <clears throat> textual preacher, and so I, I'm not topical. Uh, we go through books of the Bible at times, but oftentimes I will preach more textually than in, my, in a sermon series. So that, that's what works for me. Getting that week alone, and, I, and I, one of the things that oftentimes people say, well, pastor, enjoy your vacation, your time away. It is hardly a vacation. It's one of the most grueling weeks that I spend every year. However, <clears throat> getting alone, getting there, getting alone with God, finding out what he wants me to do, has freed up so much time in my schedule by taking that week. And I don't know about you guys, but I found if the sermon can get done on Monday, the rest of the week can fall apart totally, and it's really not that bad a week. Like, when the sermon's done for Sunday, I'm living in a, a much better state of mind the rest of the week. By getting alone and coming up with the big ideas, I come up with my main idea. Sometimes I have two or three points, sometimes not. But I read the text numerous times, decide what text I'm going to use. I throw everything on a legal pad that works for me of what I'm going to do, thoughts for the message. And then I come back. And then with working, I have a research assistant that helps. We could talk about that a different time, but predominantly with uh, connective tissue illustrations, things of that nature. But then I come back and meet with my team, and then we plan out the six-month block. And that allows our, our AVL people, our, our creative worship people, our, our music, all they get to take all of that and start working ahead so that the series and the sermon series and the, the, the service on Sunday is seamless and, and cohesive and doesn't feel disjointed. If you will do that in advance, and you've put that much time in for a week at a time, that's two weeks a year, and, and if you put 40 to 60 hours into that week, then I make the argument with proper planning, you can sit down in an eight to 10 hour time frame on a Monday and get that sermon written out for the upcoming week. That has helped me more in planning for the new year, planning for each year, and getting on top of things. Now, far be it for me to tell everybody in this room this, but I think oftentimes what happens, we allow the little things that aren't as important to replace the thing that is most important. And I found by this is the biggest rock that I have in the bucket because that hour every Sunday morning, hour and 15 minute service that we do twice on Sunday, that is the most important thing that I am living for as a pastor each week. Getting that done, getting far ahead, working ahead. So you may be here and go, I don't do that. So I would encourage you, start to look for ways that you could build some margin into your schedule to get away. Maybe it's not for a week. Maybe it's just two days. Maybe it's a day. Anything would be a great start, an improvement to get you going. Because by doing that, you can get out ahead and then on Monday each week, deal with that sermon and get that done. The second thing that I would just speak into for just a few moments would be around the area of staff development and staff leadership. I don't know about you, but the two things that, that consume my schedule the most is what I'm going to preach and getting ready for that, and then leading our leadership team. Um, now, you may be tempted to say, Robbie, I, I pastor 150 people. I am the leader. 
But I would encourage you, if you begin to look at the standpoint of leading leaders, even though you don't have that many leaders yet, that's what grows ministries. If you're going to be the pastor that does everything, you're not going to be able to grow to a certain size because you only have so many hours in a day. So we have found here by developing uh, our staff, developing our leadership personally, developing our leadership as a team, that has gone a long way to help us in making our goals and planning for each year. Let me speak briefly as to what that looks like. You may remember, uh, I think it was back in early fall we had, or, or late spring, early summer, we had Mark Miller from Chick-fil-A that was here on, on the uh, network uh, for Tuesday. I'm a big fan of Mark Miller. I've read just about everything that he's written. He's written a number of books, but I would just give you a, a resource here that would be great. He wrote a book entitled Chess, Not Checkers. And that probably did more to help revolutionize some things in our leadership structure. And I'll tell you the four points that he really works on in that book is, is really a, a, a series of four changes for calculations, for strategies that help develop the team. Number one is bet on leadership. And the idea is that everything rises and falls on leadership. We all know that, but emphasizing leadership, developing leaders, whether you are a church of 75 or a church of 7,500, if you're not developing leaders, you're going to limit your ability to grow your organization. You've got to grow leaders. That's just the end of the day. Secondly, Mark Miller says lead is one. So what does that look like? That, that means developing a cohesive agenda where we're all paddling the canoe the same direction. Nothing is more frustrating than to have six oars in the water and everybody's thrashing around doing their own thing expending a ton of energy but getting nowhere and so we want to be going the same direction and so lead is one the third series of bold moves that mark pointed out in this book was capture the heart <clears throat> and me, what we mean by that is we develop our leaders we develop an agenda to lead as one but then we capture their heart so that we earn the right to cast vision, to speak into their life, to make corrections, to help them develop their agenda. And then his fourth point, and the thing that I want to just park on for the last few minutes, is excel at execution. Excel at execution. Maybe you haven't had this problem. I will tell you a, a weakness that I struggle with that I've really tried to work hard and develop over the past few years. I have no shortage of vision. I have no shortage of ideas. I can come up with more shiny objects to lead me away from the main goal in a, in a 10 minute shower than the average person on staff could come up with in three weeks. Execution is where we have to make sure that we're following through. In other words, we, we ready, aim, 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 and we never fire the gun. There comes a point where you just got to fire the gun. How we have done that here, we've done two things that, that I just will speak into in planning for a new year that I would encourage you to think about. Um, number one is your, your staff development. If you don't have staff, your lay leadership development. When I was children's pastor here, I did not have one paid person under me on staff, but I had seven people that came to the office every week and worked anywhere from eight to 15 hours a week. That's what I'm talking about, developing leaders, developing that pipeline of leadership. How do we do that? We need to give them responsibilities so that their job is clear. If you don't have a job description or key result areas, I would encourage you start there. We need to delegate authority. And the way that we do that is by uh, let them lead. Stop micromanaging our team. They're going to make mistakes 
a good policy manual and a good set of key result areas will greatly determine then what they need to do so that you can be hands off much more and let them lead. And then coaching. This is something that most of you know I'm pretty passionate about. In our ministry here, this is something that we found that we do with our pastoral team and our key ministry leaders and department heads. And it is the, 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 the four by four by four leadership process. Let me just briefly share this with you as I wrap my session up. We ask our team, especially our pastors, those in key leadership, tell us the four by four by four principle is this, what four people are you meeting with this week? I, I, now, for some of your team and some of you, that's not a problem. They're so people oriented that trying to limit them to four people would be hard. They, they just naturally are people persons, but you've got other people that serve in your area that they are so task oriented, they would just assume go down a rabbit hole and never speak to a church member, a prospective member, uh, develop a leader. That's just not the way they're wired. They need that accountability. So who are the four people that you're meeting with this week? And then the other four by four is what four tasks are you trying to accomplish over the next four weeks? I really like this because this allows us to make sure in leadership that the people we have delegated authority to are actually following through with our agenda. This is how I make sure everybody's paddling the canoe the same way, that we're not all just thrashing around the oars in the water. Making sure that they're meeting with four people each week, that, that might be for leadership development, recruitment onto the ministry team, developing an assimilation process, you pick, doesn't matter. Four people that you're meeting with this week, four tasks that you're accomplishing over the next four weeks. They have to give that to us and we approve that. We don't wanna micromanage them, but we wanna make sure we're going the same way. And then here is where the coaching and the reward comes in. This is something that it's certainly not original with us. I know Tice does it at Southern Hills. There may be, Jeremy, you may be doing it up there in Ohio. But we set aside in our budget above the pastoral staff and these department heads and ministry leaders, we set their base salary plus an additional 6% in the budget. And each of these guys are eligible every quarter for a one and a half percent of their salary incentive bonus, performance bonus that we give them based on did they meet the objectives of the goals that we have. And it's not just the objectives and goals that they have, it's our goals too. And we look at, are we growing as a ministry? Did our attendance grow in that quarter? Is our salvation decisions, our baptisms, the new members, all those are metrics that we include in this. Are we meeting church budget? If we're not meeting church budget, it won't be a surprise that if we're under budget, then, then we all feel this. We're all sharing the responsibility together. I would encourage you guys, and I, I, I've just hit two really specific areas on a high overview, but I would just encourage you as you plan ahead for the new year, the more that we can do to, to plan long-term out, to delegate responsibility, but then also to follow up and make sure that people are doing what we've asked and they're being rewarded accordingly, and that we're, as senior pastors, that we're sharing the burden. I shouldn't be the only one that is feeling the, the heartburn when offerings are down. The whole team needs to understand that that's happening. And I see Josh smiling. We, there's, I don't know about Josh but, and the rest of you guys, but there's been times that I just sat on that and carried that burden silently. And they didn't know that we missed budget by $10,000 two weeks in a row. Um, so I would encourage you to share that responsibility, share that burden, share that with everybody, help hold everybody accountable. Let's work on our sermon planning. Let's work on our leadership development. 
guys, as we go into the next year, if we can emphasize these two things, if you didn't do anything else, if you just focused on these two things, I believe you would find that you would have an enormous amount of time that would get freed up in your schedule. And if nothing else, even if you didn't take a lot off your schedule, your schedule might be a lot more enjoyable. I'm just telling you, when the sermon's done on Monday night, and when I go home Tuesday, knowing that the team is all doing what I need them to do, a lot of things can go wrong the rest of the week, and it still not be a bad week. But when I don't have prompt, uh, my sermon prep done, when I am not leading my team and holding them accountable, that is when I begin to struggle as a leader, and I fall back into managing my team and managing my life rather than leading my team and leading my life. So I, I hope that that uh, will be a help to you as you think about uh, moving forward into uh, 2023. Jason, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thanks Robbie. I appreciate the work that you put into that session. I think what we're gonna do today guys is just stay together in one room. What I'd like to start out by doing, if it's okay, is Robbie sent some discussion questions. We can get to those. But I want to start by doing a little bit of Q&A. If you guys have a question specifically for Robbie uh, based on his content today, I'm going to go to the gallery view so we can all see each other. Uh, if you guys have got a question specifically for Robbie on content of what he talked about today, whether it was staff development, preaching series, scheduling, uh, anybody want to go first, ask a question for Robbie, and then after that, we'll go to his discussion questions for all of us. Robbie, do you preach or teach on Wednesday evening? I do service? not. I okay. do not. We have uh, small groups and, an, and a number of other things happening on Wednesday night. Okay. I'd be curious, does anybody still preach on Wednesday or teach on Wednesday? And when do you study? Uh, when do you put study time in for that? Steven says right now, while we're on here, he's studying for Wednesday night. <laughs> Here's the sermon outline you can use. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be going back to midweek, um, a partial midweek, March to June, and then from September to November. Um, and I'm going to be doing a midweek uh, type of a service. And my plan for teaching or my, my plan for study for that is a three hour block on um, uh, late Tuesday afternoons. So really, it's it's simply Tuesday, the, the class starts or the service will start at 630. And I'll plan my teaching uh, my study time from 330 to 630. That's what I did for years when I did a Wednesday evening Bible study. And that's what I'll go back to. When I used to do Wednesday nights regularly, I, I used Wednesday mornings. I just got up and, and that same thing. I spent about three hours on it. And Jeremy, still, how do you uh, do it? I do mine on uh, Wednesday mornings and um, pretty much preparing that. I, I, I typically use a, a book that, well, like recently we finished uh, going through uh, Tony Evans' book, Kingdom Man. And I use that as kind of a guide. And then I'll pull from that and I don't teach exactly uh, his outline or whatever, but uh, kind of that as the theme. And that's kind of how I do it. Philip, if you did exactly like Kim, we were going to use you for the next summit. So we want to book you now for that. If you would. Um, I, I, um, I actually preach twice on Wednesday. We do a one o'clock service and, um, and then a seven o'clock service, same message but it gives people that are working second shift the opportunity to come. And then older folks as well um, gives them the opportunity to come. We we're dark, like right now by five o'clock, it is like midnight in Ohio right now. And at least where we're at. So we, um, we probably have about 65 that come out to the one o'clock service. So it's a decent, decent attended service. So I have to study for Wednesday on Tuesdays. Uh, normally Tuesday afternoon is when I do it. Anybody doing three a week? Anybody doing Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Let me see your hands. All right. We got a couple in here. Robbie, what, what kind of advice would you give to guys that are preaching 
were teaching three individual messages a week, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to guys that are doing the three to thrive? I'm going to write your names down and pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> better people than I am. Um, th this is not a, this is, I promise, not a political statement or an agenda. It, it's just, so for me, I'm a leader that lives to lead, but has to preach. Josh Tice is a leader or a preacher that lives to preach, but has to lead. Neither is wrong. Neither is bad. It's just how we're wired. I would say lean into how you're wired. If you're wired to speak all the time, then it's not going to be a drudgery to, to preach. It, it, it was a drudgery for me to do a Sunday school lesson, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I live frustrated all the time. I just finally got to the place of like, if the demand is not there and it is not something that I'm naturally gifted at, I'm going to own it and change what needs to be changed. So if I'm not against three to thrive, honestly, Sunday night was my most enjoyable message to preach every week because it was the core people and, and I could say things that I couldn't say maybe on Sunday morning, but it just died on us. I mean, we'd have 1300 here on Sunday morning and, and 180 on Sunday night, and I did everything I could to keep it going. And it just, the people voted with their feet. So we, it was not good for us here. That doesn't mean it's not for you there. I would say if you're doing that, I would divide probably my sermon prep for my leader or my sermon prep retreat. I probably would divide that into thirds and, and take several days and, and focus on Sunday morning and others on Sunday night and others on Wednesday night. I would say from a philosophical standpoint, do as you will, but I would Sunday morning, I have the largest audience. I'm going to put the most time into Sunday morning. And if Sunday night is your next biggest crowd, then put the next amount of energy there. If Wednesday night's bigger than Sunday night, I, I would put the second amount of energy, most amount of energy into the second highest attended service. That that would be probably the only recommendation I have there. Tony, go ahead. You got a question? No, I was just going to comment. Uh, I did the three services. Actually, at one time, I was doing four because I was teaching Sunday school, morning worship, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I got so burnt out that I literally during that time have debated even quitting just because I felt like I was always falling short. And I started getting other people to rotate through. And that was a huge help for me, you know, with those other things. But I only do two now. And I start everything Monday, Tuesday. Uh, like I get my, my thoughts going, everything on paper and stuff like that. I finish my Wednesday, Wednesday, and I finish Sunday and Thursday. But I love what Robbie was talking about. That's an excellent plan. Makes me want to rethink how I do things. I will just say that one of the things that is incredible that I found when it's done on, so when it's done on Monday, it gets handed off to the the, the people that do pro presenter and you know all the graphics and all the things that have to be put together, like that all gets handed off. So my main points I can't think of a time I've ever changed a main point after Monday, but it is amazing when, when you just set, the, I set the sermon aside Monday. I don't look at it at all on Tuesday. I don't look at it at all on Wednesday. I don't look at it all on Thursday or Friday, but it is amazing how many times I will see a, a, an illustration happen right in front of me. They're like, Oh, that fits perfect for Sunday. It is amazing how many times in my personal Bible study throughout the week, I'm like, oh, I didn't even see this verse and how it relates to the, what the sermon I'm preaching. And then I pick it back up Saturday evening. I, I'm a night person. I'm not a morning person. Uh, I give the whole thing to the Lord on Saturday night. I spend an hour or so with it on Saturday night before I go to bed. Um, I, I will stay up till 2 a.m. on Sunday morning to get ready. But when I get up on Sunday morning, I roll out of bed. And, and if my church knew how little time I spent in prayer on Sunday morning, they would probably be shocked. But I spend my time on Saturday night getting ready because uh, that's just how I'm wired. And I just finally accepted it, leaned into it and said, this is what I am. Robbie's up at 2 a.m. every night. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Most. Any other questions, comments for Robbie before we get to the questions he laid out for us? 
All right, we may come back to that. I'm going to throw these in the chat. Uh, let me read through these questions, and then we'll start with one. How do you currently go about long-term sermon prep? In what ways can we better prepare for the upcoming sermon series? Two, uh, how do you go about deciding what series to preach? Three, do you currently offer an incentive program for your leadership team? Why or why not? Four, do you currently do staff reviews? How often and how? Let's start with one, um, long-term sermon prep. What are ways that you guys are doing it? Because Robbie shared the talk, but I think he'd be interested to hear what some of you guys are doing as well as far as long-term sermon prep. Do you guys preach on Sundays? <laughs> Here, I'll throw something yeah, go ahead, Larry. Um, I don't have like a, a sermon development six month plan, but I do have a, a an outline of where I'm going to be going. So I'm not looking at a passage fresh on Monday morning, trying to figure out where would I go with this passage. I'm actually planning further ahead than that, but definitely not a six month. And that's uh, definitely something to be thinking about that planning retreat. In fact, I plan on from here to the end of the year using my Mondays as some pre prep and because I have Monday kind of, I just do lightweight stuff on Mondays, but I like the idea of being able to to prep ahead something that I'm not preaching that Sunday, something that's coming further down the road. Because I, I I do my final sermon prep on Friday morning. It's just a perfect spot for me, and, and it just works. But uh, most people don't like to wait that long. And uh, just to clarify something, my four messages that I do uh, a week, two of them are the same message twice. And then uh, one of them is discipleship, which is printed material. I'm not studying for that. And so it's it's not like I'm preparing four messages a week. Uh, I'm preparing one message primarily a week. So, Yeah, I see a question here from uh, Stephen that asked if I have a designated days off. I do. Um, Friday and Saturday are supposed to be my days off every week. Uh, I really work hard at getting Saturday off. Uh, I, if I'm just totally honest, uh, depending on the week and what's happened and if there's been funerals and tragedies and everything else, I would say I probably get 50% of my Fridays off. Um, I usually am dealing with something Friday morning wrapping up, but I, I, I really work hard at trying to get Friday and Saturday off. And my thinking behind that is I want to be the most refreshed and ready for Sunday. That's the most important day of the week. And then going back to the sermon prep on Monday, that's my next highest day of energy. As I, as I go further in the week, my energy level is dropping. And I had a budget committee meeting last night with the, our executive pastor and budget committee finalizing next year's budget. And we got done at 11 o'clock last night. So like my energy level is, is going to continually just drop as we go through the week. So hence the Sunday and Monday and taking Friday, Saturday off. Good question. All right, anybody else on number one, long-term sermon prep? What are you guys doing? Jason, I'll say that um, my first year coming up as a full-time pastor, um, the way I've gone about it this year so far is is planning um, on the direction that I believe the Lord has taken our church. Um, for 2023, our theme is gonna be next. What is next for Elon Baptist Church? And so I'm already uh, next week and planning on finishing up my sermon. I'm actually doing a whole year of sermon planning just based off of that subject and doing some different sermon series centered around that topic. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be doing a full year going forward, but I the, just feel like the Lord was just leading me that direction for this coming year. And so I'm going to try the, the whole year and see how that goes. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. For me, I've just been a pastor four years. Um, I discount COVID year, so just three years. Uh, for me, we've been lately picking a yearly theme. Um, I don't know moving forward, but we have different seasons in the church. We won't set a yearly theme, but I, I try to preach around that big idea. So this upcoming year, uh, we've been talking about kind of inward growth. Growth was 2021 moving forward. 2022 was, was grow. And then 2023 is going to be reaching out. And so a lot of my 
sermons throughout the year are wrapped around the big idea. And then I usually will do sort of a book study. So for grow, man, Paul was looking to grow the, the church of Corinth. So I went through first and second Corinthians and that really said a lot of what I did throughout the year. So I start with that big idea and kind of preach out of that. All right. Anyone else on one? I'm just curious. How many of you preach around a theme for a year at a time? You set a yearly theme for your church and, and work with that. How many of you do that? I do. I have, but I just don't, I don't feel led to do that this year. Yeah, we've done it in the past here. I, I'm not right now. I'm not against it, not opposed to it. It just uh, doesn't fit the season that we're in right now. I, I was just curious. All right, I want to move to two. How do you go about deciding what series to preach? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but every time Josh Tice posts what he's doing for his next three or four or five weeks, uh, there's a part of me that thinks, man, how did he come up with that? So, Josh, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but uh, for all of you in the room, how do you go about deciding what series to preach uh, at a given time? I hire people to tell me what to preach. <laughs> what a great answer. Yeah. What we do, I think I've mentioned it here, so I won't waste time, but what, what I do is I get away and plan out the year, but then I come back and I have two creative meetings with, um, and most of the people at that table are not paid staff. Um, there's only two people at that table now, but there's six of them and they're creatives. And uh, I sit with them for three hours and I buy them lunch and I sit with them for three hours at each time. And I say, this is where I'm going. And these are the series that I want to preach on. What would you, you know, what would you say? And uh, what creative ideas could we come up with? And I'm, I, I honestly, there are set, there are things said in there that are insane. There are great ideas. There are things said in there that are incredibly inappropriate, um, genuinely, because of the people that I have in, they're creatives, they're, they're, they're anything that comes to mind. But we come up with some really good concepts from that so we brainstorm it in a collaborative way and i do think those guys that i've talked to about that sometimes get the idea like if i had three staff people i'd do that if i was pastoring a church of 150 people tomorrow i'd be taking out the three creatives not necessarily maybe one of them's a deacon but not my three deacons um i would find the most creative people in the room and then i would buy them lunch and i'd sit with them for three hours and i'd say here's what i'm coming up to over the next six months what would you call this concept? What creative idea would you have about this idea? And then I would take that and send it to a designer. I love that. It's a great idea. Anyone else? What do you what do you do? What's your process to determine what you preach next? I've never really been one to preach a lot of series. Um, I my my mind doesn't work that way. Um I'm just, I just preach verse by verse, you know, through a book right now, we're going through revelation on Sunday. I'm pre I'll be preaching chapter 15, you know, so that's, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm going. And, and everybody knows what's next, you know? So, um, I, 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 tr I try to keep it simple because like I said, my mind doesn't work in the, uh, in the way of, of like dividing it up in series, but I enjoy it um both ways but that's that's us nice anyone else want to weigh in on this one yeah go ahead jerry it's uh another question for josh we're just gonna make josh take over yeah. uh i don't know if i've heard it before josh but what kind of input does that uh creative team put in as far as those series and everything that you're doing is that like titles or artwork designer what's what is all included in that you're muted josh sorry um yeah i'll come to a series like um let's see what am i in right now I'll, I'll come to luke chapter 11 which is what i'm in right now and i'll say okay what i'm looking for is the main theme of the chapter and obviously the people who divided the chapter so many years ago were not thinking in those same terms but what, what we've noticed from all of our studies is that there are certain themes in chapter three of Philippians that are different from chapter two of Philippians, 
even though the entirety of Philippians is about joy in the midst of difficulty, right? So we gra grasp themes and sometimes that theme will go from verse one to verse 28, or sometimes it'll just be half the chapter. Whenever I grab a theme, for example, the theme of Luke chapter 11, as I've studied it, is light versus darkness, good versus evil, the devil versus Satan, demonic forces versus angelic host. It seems to be the running theme throughout the entirety of the chapter. So I've come to a creative team, and after I've studied that, any Bible student can do that after they spend a lot of time soaking in the text. And I say, that's the theme. What would you call a sermon series about good versus evil and light versus darkness? Um, and then allow them to go with it, right? And uh, so we came up with Glow um, as a sermon series, uh, where the light meets the darkness, because I expressed this is the moment where Jesus is Jesus starts really going after the darkness and starts attacking it through prayer and the Holy Spirit and then attacking the Pharisees. Um, it's really bold. And so we go with glow where the light meets the darkness. And that's um, that then informs what the look will be like. Um, we say, come up with a theme or an idea that I could I could visualize on on church programs and in in social media graphics and stage decor and glow leads to that. So the first is understanding the concept of what you're trying to teach topically or the text. Once you get that one big idea, then don't feel like you have to be creative. I think you can bring it to creatives and say, this is the main concept. What does that creatively look like? Can you paint me a picture in your mind? Tell me more about the stories. And some of them don't even know the stories. You know, Jesus starts yelling at the religious people. Like, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, okay, I can see. So there's like, there's like tension. Yeah, there's tension. So then through the dialogue, we're able to say, you know what, that is a good idea. Um, light versus darkness, uh, good versus evil. And then, and then we're able to solidify it that way. Does that kind of make you, sense? Yeah, yeah. Do you um, kind of give them that, uh, at least like the chapters and everything that you're going on ahead of time? And then come back to it or in that three hours there you're just uh, all hashing it out there i don't want them to know what the text says ahead of time i want to i want to tell them what the text says um <laughs> yeah. by saying this is what this chapter is about now what, what does that creatively look like and then when you said down to the sermon titles yes um the first meeting is about the series and the second meeting i'm about to go into next week is about the titles and it's like okay where did, how does that progress through um through a sermon series of these four different aspects of Luke chapter 11. Um, what are these four stories? And then we have progression uh, through. Yeah. So they can speak into that. And a lot of times they'll say stuff and I'm like, yeah, no, that is way too far away from what the text is actually saying. No, we can't go that direction. Right. Um, and they'll fall in love with an idea. And I'm like, I can't preach. That's not what this is saying. <laughs> and I do think, by the way, practically having done that enough, I do think that's why you find guys Oh. oh, I thought it went off. I think that's why you find guys that will be preaching something. You're like, that's not there um, in big megachurch settings. And, and I think it's because they'll follow a creative process and then they they don't stick to a point that they that is actually in the text. They started following a creative process mm -hmm. rather than following the text. So that's good stuff. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to three. Do you currently offer an incentive program for your leadership team? Why or why not? Robbie, that was such a fascinating concept, um, how you split up that 6% quarterly. Uh, anybody do anything like that currently, if you have a staff? So can I just, yep, I would just quickly add, I forgot to say this. Sometimes when I coach pastors, I say, we don't have the money to do this. And that's a legitimate, like, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. So start with time off. It costs you nothing to give guys paid time off. That, And I found oftentimes with certain team members, they live on such a strict budget and are so well with their finances. I don't mean they're wealthy, but I mean, they just, the money is not the key. They, like, I would rather have three extra days off than a one and a half percent bonus. Find what motivates them. And another team member, it might be something else. It might be you send them away to a church member's cabin or, or condo or timeshare or something somewhere that they get. So it doesn't have to be money. That's just what we've done here. 
I tried to get in before you added any ideas to stop you because one of my, my staff member is in this Zoom meeting. And so <laughs> I didn't want him to get any ideas ahead of me. But uh, we've thought of it, but like like you just said, sometimes it's not in the budget. And so we do, primarily, we just give time off. Like when things are happening, we just say, hey, take some time and enjoy that. You're keeping up with everything else. And so they've already earned that time off long before they get it. And so yeah, the time off one is probably more feasible for us. I find the benefit of doing something like this, Robbie, which we do, um, and, and we do both. Uh, we do perks, bonuses, and time off as different things for different. But I find the benefit of it is that it gives very strong clarity as it relates to expectations. And it gives deadline to expectations. So um, I did this for, with my team for years. And just last year, I started applying it to myself um, to where I go to the chairman of our deacons once a quarter and I walk them through, you know, these are the goals that I want to do this quarter. And, um, and the nice thing about it is there's actual clarity, um, about what date I need this done by. And so I, one of my goals for the spring was to write an evangelistic campaign for the fall. Once I got that done, that evangelistic campaign's goal was 182 guests between August 28th and uh, the second Sunday in, in November. So it was very clear. I needed to do in the spring, write a program that would get us that many guests and then in the fall, I needed to get us that many guests by executing that, um, that evangelistic program, which I don't normally do. Anyway, doing that, I'm looking at a deadline date in the middle of October that's like by the middle of November, I need to have this many guests. So what does that make me do? <laughs> it makes me add into my sermon ideas about bring your friends to church and, and make sure they're here. Because if, if you do set goals and then put dates to those goals, um, it tends to motivate you to do what you would not have done otherwise, right? So if you wanted to lose a certain amount of weight by a certain date and you're not getting there, maybe you won't eat as much for the next five days to get to that date because it's a numeric goal that you're shooting for. And I understand that only works for certain personalities that might be goal-driven. Uh, but if you do have that tendency at all, or you have people working with you that have that tendency, then use their psychosis against them by helping them accomplish goals uh, by setting dates. I would say it's great too, in the sense of we all have staff, they're all wired different way. We all have lay leadership, whatever. But I've got some really solid guys on the team that if we they didn't have this, they would do everything else under the sun except the main thing that I've asked them to do. And yeah. like, there's no escaping this. Okay, your department, your area of ministry, whatever, we want you to grow by this many. Well, when they have to bring the attendance report into the meeting and we look at the numbers, the numbers don't lie. And it's not like, you know, we're, we're not all about just numbers here, but we unapologetically, uh, we, we use those as metrics to the point that I've looked a staff member in the face and just said, you know, this probably isn't the best fit for you on our team because I'm not changing who we are. Like you need to go, it, it's free. Like it, 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 it creates a culture that people either buy into or they move on. And I'm okay with either because the culture that I'm building, I'm committed to. Most men understand the sports analogy. And so for me, um, I'll look at them and, and I'll say, and I have many times, especially with new people coming onto the team, I do not want to drive you, but you're, 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 uh, excuse the analogy. Don't get offended by the terms I'm about to use. Uh, you're, you're at Alabama now and I'm Nick Saban and I want you to win. We're going to win and we are going to win and we're going to win unless we're playing LSU. And the way we're going to win is by, I'm going to set some very high goals. We're going to set whole high goals, uh, together. And, and here's the thing, you're going to be exhausted. And sometimes you're going to be upset at the coach. But what's really going to be great is at the end of every quarter, you're going to be like, wow, we won. And we won again, and we won again, and we won again. And I don't want you to not win. I also don't want you to be exhausted. So I'm going to make sure you have personal life goals of rest and home life and, and your family is cared for. And there are going to be times I'm going to come to you and say, you have to take time off because your kids need you. Um, but letting them know that they're on a winning team and <clears> they <throat> is a big aspect I think that's helpful in this. Yeah, yeah. 
Yep. Good. As I said, Larry asked about lay leaders. I, I would just say, I would go back to the principles that Mark Miller talked about and, and bet on leadership. So that's developing leaders and then lead is one. And then his third point was capture the heart. Listen, passion takes us where paychecks will never take us. I do what I do here at the church not because I get a paycheck. I do what I do here at the church because I'm absolutely passionate about what God's called me to do. Some of the best leaders I've ever had in this church that ended up on my staff were for many years on staff level position, but not paid, but had the influence and the leadership responsibilities of a staff member. And you develop them the same way because we don't want people that are here motivated by a paycheck. If that's the only thing that motivates you here, you're not gonna make it on this team long-term anyway, because we're passionate about what we do. Steve, did you have something? Yeah, I, my question was along the lines of Larry's and, and I think Robbie just answered most of it, but how, how much you know, can you lay on a, on a lay person? I, I'm here by myself, about a hundred folks or so. How much can I lay on them to me, <clears throat> I kind of feel guilty, like, shouldn't I be doing this? Or, you know, and I know that's probably too prideful of an approach, but how much can you lay on people, I guess, and uh, how much should you take off yourself is what I wanted to ask. Let me ask you this question, Stephen. This isn't uh, a critical, it's just curious. How old are you? 36. Okay. I've noticed something with people under 40. This isn't critical. I've just, this is what I've noticed. So my generation and older, so I'm coming up on 50. My generation and older, it, it was oftentimes give it all to Jesus. I'd rather burn out than rust out. And we just chewed people up, right? That's wrong. We shouldn't do that. But for every extreme that's one way, the next generation often takes an extreme and goes the other way. I have found a lot of pastors that I've coached in their 30s that really struggle. And I'm not saying this is you. I don't, I don't have enough of a relationship with you. Oh, it is. It is. I, I would just say that, that there's a lot of guys that are very fearful of asking for a certain level of commitment. I go for whatever they will give me. I know my heart well enough to know that if they're getting overextended, I'm going to pull them back in. So that I'm, as their pastor, I have to watch out for them. So that requires a level of integrity and a level of intentionality on my part that, yeah, they could probably get me another notch on the ladder, but it's going to ruin their family doing it. So I'm going to pull them back. But, but creating that fire and letting the, most of our volunteers are going to tell you when they're hitting, not all, but most of the time you, you're going to sense when they're hitting their limit and you need to back off. Uh, uh, that generally has not been the, the problem that I see. It's it's being fearful of asking. I remember one pastor told me one night, he's like, I just don't feel like I could ask um, a person to do something that low, that, that degrading. And my response was, oh, I said, I'm sorry. I guess the verse about handing out a cup of cold water in Jesus' name is no longer applicable today. Like, we have to... We ought to be willing to do anything as a pastor, but there's certain things that I just need others to take off of me because my time is not best spent putting Christmas lights on the shrubbery out front. I need to be preparing a message. Awesome. Any last minute thoughts, questions, comments? Hey, Jason, one of the things we just started last year, um, we've tried everything for incentives what we went through and it's really helped us. We um, give days off, but we let the staff member's wife pick the days off. So if a staff member hits that goal, she gets to pick five days off a year. Um, most of the time it's her birthday. Um, it's, it's special things. What that does, what I have found, the wife is now supporting her husband in meeting his goals. And in ministry, a lot of times the husband's doing it himself and the wife is maybe frustrated because he's giving so much time by including that and rewarding her. She is like giving him everything. So um, the, the thing we've added this year, um, and I'll, I'll let you know how it goes, is 
one of the rewards is you get a day off, but you have to go Christmas shopping with your wife one day during the week, during the month of December is one of your incentive goals. She gets to pick the day. So she's going shopping in the middle of the week with her husband and our staff ladies are already excited about that op that opportunity. So get the staff wives involved. Good. They will motivate their staff husband. I'm That's giving awesome. you credit for that the first time, Jeremy, and then it's my idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, guys, we are out of time. Ravi, thanks again for being with us today. So practical. Really appreciate um, the talk today. Hey, I want to tell you what's coming up next week. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with evangelist Dave Young, but he's going to be with us next week. Uh, his topic is maintaining a healthy relationship with your spouse while serving in busy ministry. Uh, it's a long title, but man, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a good one. So mark your calendars to be with us one week from today. We'll see you guys in 167 hours next week. Same time, same place. Have a great week. Bye-bye.